and welcome everyone to Women's Health Tech Wednesdays. I am your host, Nina Joshi, and for a very exciting International Women's Day episode, I'm really excited for our guest, Inara. But before we kind of jumpstart our discussion, just wanted to give you all some quick reminders. We do have our Breakthrough Innovators Challenge applications live, so if you are interested in that, all of that information is going to be in the chat. We also have our March Symposium coming up at the end of this month. Um, so please be sure to check that out. It's going to be a really great event. Lots of awesome speakers. And if you are interested in joining our Breakthrough Board, all of that information and the applications are available in the chat as well. And so with that, we'd like to formally introduce and bring on our guest, Inara Lalani, the co-founder of Femme Therapeutics. And as you know, on this show, we love questions. So if you have any for Inara during the conversation, please add them to the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and I will make sure that we get to it. So with that, welcome, Inara. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Nina. Pleasure to be here, especially on um, International Women's Day. It's super exciting <laughs> to kind of share this, this, um, this discussion with you today. Awesome. Yeah, well, we're really excited to just kind of jump right in. I uh, would love if maybe you can start things off by sharing a little bit more kind of about yourself and your background. Sure, happy to. So um, I did my undergraduate degree from McGill University focused in um, commerce. So I had a specialization in information systems, entrepreneurship, and clinical innovation. During my time at McGill, I had the opportunity to go through um, an innovation program that's similar, similarly modeled to the Stanford Biodesign Program where we were thrown into the OR and the ICU, had to shadow doctors around the hospital. Um, and essentially the goal was to identify a clinical need. Um, and so through that experience, um, we were able to conceptualize uh, Femme Therapeutics, which I'm very wow. happy uh, to, to share with you guys today. That's incredible. I didn't know that was kind of the genesis of the company, just really being able to see, you know, boots on the ground, some of the, the pain points. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, you know, the best way, um, or, or as they say, the best way to identify um, a, a solution is, is to go through that design thinking process and, you know, learn firsthand from uh, the root of the problem itself. So uh, very lucky to be able to go through that experience. That is incredible. And would love if you could share a little bit more about Fem Therapeutics. You know, what is the mission of the company and what are some of the solutions that you have to solve a, a clinical need? Happy to. Yeah. So bridging off of, you know, that um, experience that we had, um, essentially we were thrown into the OR on one specific day, had to shadow one of our physicians and found out that he was scheduled to perform quite a few hysterectomies that day. Um, and for those of you that don't know, a hysterectomy is, is really just a surgical procedure to remove the uterus. Um, and so when we, you know, identified why those surgeries were so common, our physician had told us that because the non-invasive solutions were failing, um, to what exactly, um, that, the, that, you know, what we're targeting is pelvic floor disorders. Um, and so pelvic floor disorders affect one in every three women. This can, um, take the place of stress urinary incontinence or pelvic organ prolapse, um, and essentially that involves the descent of the bladder, rectum, or uterus down the vaginal canal uh, due to the weakening in pelvic floor muscles. And really the only other solution aside from the non-invasive um, options would be to, you know, do the surgical alternative and, and have um, your uterus removed or uh, perform pelvic reconstructive surgery. Um, and so that really, you know, had our, that really got our um, wheels turning and wanted to kind of dive a little bit deeper onto why those non-invasive solutions were failing in the first place. Um, and so that's how we kind of conceptualized uh, Femme Therapeutics with a mission to, you know, bridge the gender health innovation gap and to provide more, um, you know, innovative solutions out there for such common women's health conditions. Wow, that is an incredible mission. And I think it must have been you know, so impactful to really see this firsthand um, as, as it's happening. And would love if you could share a little bit more. I know you kind of mentioned um, prolapse and stress urinary incontinence are kind of those the two major pelvic conditions that are kind of very common, or is there kind of a large subset that fall in, under this category? 
Yeah, so specifically looking at pelvic floor disorders, we see that one in every three women will um, face some sort of symptom at some stage in their life. Oh, wow. And um, high risk factors for this can be either through vaginal childbirths or um, menopause. So, so really aging and um, going through that natural life cycle where your um, ligaments and pelvic floor just begins to weaken over time. Um, specifically looking at pelvic organ prolapse, prevalence rates are about one in 10 women, um, but they increase as age increases. So one in every two over 80 will actually experience this at some stage. So this is a very common and very important problem to solve. Exactly, exactly. And again, the vision of the company is to certainly focus on, on pelvic floor disorders first, but you know, we see a, a wide variety of pelvic health conditions that have similarly high prevalence rates um, where the non-invasive solutions are failing, some of which include preterm labor, um, post-cancer therapy, which um, you know can impact the uh, the structure of the vaginal canal, causing it to narrow or shorten over time. Um, and so, and so, there's really a huge need here to innovate in this space. Absolutely, and you kind of touched on you know some of the existing solutions in the market and how these are not effective. Would love if you could kind of expand on that a little bit. You know, how have these conditions been historically treated? What are some of the existing pain points? Is it kind of a convenience or accessibility driven pain point, or is it just the technology that's kind of failing? Yeah, yeah. So looking into pelvic uh, pelvic organ prolapse specifically, um, there are really two treatment methods for this condition. The first I already touched on earlier, it's that surgical alternative once the non-invasive solutions fail, or if there's a higher degree of prolapse. But um, as first line of treatment, typically we see this around 90% of the time, physicians will push for um, prescribing an intravaginal device called a pessary. Um, it's really a ring-like, a disc-like a disc device that sits right below the cervix of the uterus, provides support to the pelvic floor. Um, and essentially it's meant to be managed by the patient. Um, uh, so essentially they keep the device in, they are able to insert and remove the device as they please. Um, cleaning um, is simple with just soap and water. Mm -hmm. um, and that essentially is meant to stop the symptoms of prolapse um, and, and provide support um, to avoid incontinence, both urinary and fecal. Um, but the problem with these devices are that they're mass produced. Um, they come in very geometrical shapes. Some would actually call them, uh, some would actually say they look like children's toys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and to give you an idea, these devices date back um, to the Egyptians. They're actually one of the oldest medical devices to date. Um, and so there really hasn't been much space, uh, much advancement in this space here. Um, I think the only advancement we've seen is that, you know, we've gone from using cork to silicone now, um, but the, the rough geometry of these devices have roughly stayed the same. Um, and so really there's a huge need here to tackle, you know, why these devices um, are designed the way that they are, mm -hmm. um, attribute them to the 50% failure rate within the first year for patients that use them. Um, and, and the main reason for that is because they either fall out, they, um, uh, they apply excessive pressure to the bladder and the rectum, causing bleeding, tissue erosions, you name it. So um, really the, the, the root of the problem lies in the design of these devices and, and how they're not anatomically suited to, to the women's anatomy, really. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, it's such a visceral image when you were describing, you know, children's toys and how it, it does not seem like it's really personalized or kind of meant um, for something more long term. And kind of on that note, I'm just so curious to kind of think through the approach around the product development and really designing something that is meant to provide comfort and support and last um, in a way that, you know, is, is meaningful. I would love if you could share more on that. Yeah, absolutely. I think the first, you know, key aspect here is that you know, our business is driven by two female leaders that, you know, roughly understand, you know, how this device would be inserted, well, how, like, you know, the discomfort associated to putting a foreign object inside your body. And so we really looked at, you know, how could we make these devices, you know, fit and, and just be more comfortable and, and, and not even just when the device is deployed inside the body, but even that insertion and removal process. Um, and so that led to developing an applicator to allow for the ease of insertion of the device, which is the first of its kind um, that's on that would be on the market for um, inserting pessaries. 
um, and then a removable string as well to, to allow for that collapsible removal. Um, the second piece here is that through our in, um, through our R&D efforts, we actually spent quite a bit of time studying CT on MRI scans to just under, understand um, the vaginal canal anatomy. Um, and, and to give you an idea, it's actually more oval in shape. So imagine trying to fit something circular into an oval shape. You're obviously going to see pressure applied on either side and have that be um, super uncomfortable. So that also led to the development behind our, you know, the designs of our devices and how they don't have that, you know, ring-like geometric shape um, to provide that extra comfortability. Wow. Can I just say, I was not expecting the fact that, you know, you, you and the company just being able to develop an applicator was something that was so novel. Exactly. Um, that yeah. is... In, wow. I, I mean, I'm speechless by the fact that that is not something that is currently on the market. Um, mm -hmm. I think it just really speaks to how these types of conditions are, I would say, grossly overlooked. Absolutely. Um, wow. I would love if you could share, I know some of the things that you were mentioning as you are just developing this product and really wanting it to be personalized and um, effective as well. What are some of the emerging technologies that you're using as you kind of continue to develop, refine, and maybe expand the product? Yeah, absolutely. When, you know, the vision of the business is to be able to not only de develop a more comfortable uh, pessary, but to also personalize them to each individual as every patient has unique, you know, genetics, general health, pregnancy experiences that would, you know, allow for customizing these devices for a better and more comfortable fit. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when it comes to looking at a customization model, it's tough to do that while taking standard manufacturing approaches. So what we've done is we've leveraged some of the most um, innovative and, and um, very newly developed 3D printing technologies to be able to directly 3D print our devices to get them out of the lab and into the physician's office in just two days. Um, and so we're, we're, we're very excited to be working with some leading suppliers um, in, in silicone 3D printing to be able to achieve that. And then another piece here is we leverage machine learning um, to really, you know, study how our, study the correlations between the data that we're collecting and the pessary designs that we prescribe um, in order to then further improve our designs and also provide the most, um, the most adapted pessary for that patient. I love that. I love that you're kind of having that philosophy of just continuing to iterate and optimize and always kind of improve the design of the product. Absolutely. Amazing. And for these um, these products, what's kind of the typical shelf life for something like this? Um, a typical useful life for these products tend to be five years. So for if we're taking the standard ring pessary um, that's on the markets, they are used for five years, intended to be removed once a month. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, essentially, you know, the goal is that once you have prolapse and you need a pessary, essentially you need to manage your, your symptoms lifelong. Um, you may be able to decrease in size over time with use of, of the pessary and, and, um, and good compliance. But yeah, it's, it's, it's intended to be a device that will be used uh, indefinitely. Wow. Well, I, I love that there's a lot of emphasis kind of on emerging technology and, and really trying to make that process um, a lot easier, I would imagine, for the patient, but also um, for the clinicians as well. Absolutely. And would love, I mean, I'm just now so curious about yourself and really your journey as an entrepreneur. Um, is this something that, you know, you kind of knew you wanted to pursue within the healthcare realm? Um, just would love to kind of learn a little bit more about your your overall journey. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I grew up in Southeast Asia for my my entire life. I was exposed to a lot of, you know, um, health inequalities, and and that kind of led to me wanting to pursue um, something in healthcare. I wasn't sure what exactly the the medical pathway wasn't the right fit for me, but I definitely saw myself working in healthcare management. Um, and so I decided to pursue a business degree. And, you know, just like everyone else, you're kind of geared towards thinking, should I go into consulting? Should I go into investment <laughs> making and just take that easy route? 
Um, and so I did fall under that trap, actually. I did do around two years in technology consulting um, around product management and data strategy and analytics. But, you know, I was always driven to wanting to, you know, find myself working in the healthcare industry. And when this fellowship opportunity came up, in search, uh, to do that clinical innovation program, um, I couldn't say no. <laughs> and so I enrolled in that program. It was actually a graduate level program. It brought in doctors and, and master level and PhD level engineers, but I was super lucky to be one of the only undergrads to participate in that program. Um, and at the age of 19, you know, I found myself wanting to pursue this business and haven't looked back since. That is amazing. I mean, that's when you know it's meant to be. That is absolutely incredible. And, yeah. you know, I would imagine just as this business, as this company and, you know, yourself, as you've grown, there must have been so many, you know, lessons learned, um, you know, how has the beginning and kind of the, the first iteration, you know, Fem Therapeutics 1.0, how has that kind of changed versus now? And um, are there any challenges or barriers that you kind of had to overcome during the initial conception of this company um, that you would kind of like to share as learning opportunities for us? Definitely. You know, I pursued an entrepreneurship concentration when I was at McGill, but it could not have, you know, um, prepared me even even less than what I had expected in the real world. Um, it's it's so tough to anticipate um, the challenges that you face in a, in, a, in a job like this, where, you know, certain sudden things can come up, you're always putting out fires. And, and so, you know, that you know, while while you have a good understanding or a theoretical understanding of how entrepreneurship works and how to, you know, set up your company, whether that's going through that business model canvas, you know, putting together a business plan, um, it's it's so far from the truth because you know you're constantly adapting, you're constantly changing um, the way that you're you're doing business. And so if I had to go back, you know, and 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 maybe, you know, look back at what, what our company was back in 2019, um, I would say we were at a completely different um, stand, uh, standpoint. Mm -hmm. Our vision was to, you know, just put out one product, put out the customized pessary, you know, let's create a measuring tool that can accurately scan the vaginal canal um, and, and provide a more comfortable fitted pessary. But so like since then, our vision has evolved um, it's it's gone to really create a platform to you know customize uh, the first category of prosthetics and gynecology beyond just the initial pessary, um, and to really you know make this as accessible as possible without bringing on like you know uh, any kind of imaging tools or any kind of scanning tools that would require physician adoption and and the change in clinical workflow. So. Really, the, the vision has evolved quite significantly, and I will say that it has to do a lot with, you know, um, the the access to data and the new technologies that we're, see we're, we're seeing um, that, that are launched in the market every day. Absolutely. And I, I think it must also be so um, amazing and rewarding to as you're kind of having these conversations, you're talking to all these people in the space, you're really opening up your aperture a little bit to really understand um, it seems like just the the scale of the problem and really the need. So it's amazing that your mission is kind of getting bigger and bigger to solve the you know, big problem. Absolutely. It's amazing. And I also want to congratulate you for becoming a finalist and the winner of the Women's Health Tech Challenge for a Hit Lab. Um, that's very awesome. And, you know, as we kind of think about not just Hit Lab, but really the role of community in general, you know, what has that kind of looked like for you and kind of the importance of building a community and building a network when it comes to not only just your um, goals kind of with the company as an entrepreneur, but really just as, you know, someone that wants to make a change in the healthcare space. Definitely. You know, when we started off, and I will say even today, a lot of our mentors are male. <laughs> and I think that's just the nature of the industry that we're in. Healthcare is predominantly, you know, male driven. Mm -hmm. And so it's always been a challenge to have, you know, female advocates or female mentors that understand, you know, the struggles of running you know, a femtech business, but also have it be female founded, because that comes with its own set of biases and stereotypes as well that we constantly have to address. Um, and so the importance of really finding the right people that mirror your values, that mirror 
your experiences and having them advocate for you is so, so, so important in this type of work. Um, and, and so we've been very, very lucky to find, you know, those, those mentors here and there through programs run at HitLab, but also through other conferences and other initiatives that we're part of. Um, and just getting that representation um, around the table is so important to us. You know, our company is also um, led by BIPOC individuals as well. So that's also been another stigma that we've had to face, um, you know, growing a business in, in North America and trying to address, you know, the such a prevalent condition that has so many um, just it is is just so dynamic in its nature that it can present differently um, in in a Caucasian woman versus an African American. So that has really been you know true to our our vision and our values as a business to make sure that we have the right representation around the table to to make sure that our product is as accessible and as um, as as um, effective as possible. Absolutely, I mean being able to have those voices, that representation, and really. Um, folks that can not only speak to it, but be your advocate. I love that you kind of mentioned that um, and really the role of community that can, you know, lift all everyone up. So very fitting. I what a great conversation for uh, International Women's Day. Um, no, I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, before we get too far, we do have some questions from the audience. I want to make sure that we are able to get to it. Um, yeah. So one of the questions that we have is, how long does it take to get such a fem therapeutics pessary? So it it will take, you know, just a 20 to 30 minute consultation with a physician. Um, essentially, they will conduct a pelvic exam and take around 15 to 20 numerical measurements using um, the standard of care tools that are available on the market. Um, and so from there, they would input those measurements into our software. We design a device, the physician approves the device, and then it takes us about two days to 3D print and post-process the device um, before it's it's back in the physician's hand for the initial pessary fitting. Wonderful. Awesome. And another question that we have is, do doctors or patients pay for this or both parties? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So um, the you know, in terms of our initial market launch, we are pursuing a cash pay model, but definitely in, you know, two to three years time when we're able to obtain enough clinical evidence, we will be seeking um, insurance coverage codes for our devices as well. Wonderful. Um, and then another question, you know, what are some of the, the other areas that you're kind of as a company, maybe in the future, kind of the long-term conditions that you are kind of looking to um, be able to impact or create solutions for? Yeah, yeah, I kind of hinted on this at the beginning, but um, preterm labor is a really big one. So there are pessaries that are used to essentially hold the cervix closed. Um, but again, those those pessaries um, actually come in only two sizes and have very, very low compliance um, because of the discomfort <laughs> the devices cause, shocker. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> essentially, the next phase of development for us would be to really consider how we can develop a pessary to um, prevent that condition um, and hold and help hold the baby to term. Um, and then the second kind of piece here is um, around post cancer therapy. So again, um, how mm -hmm. can we maintain the integrity of the vaginal canal or the structure of the vaginal canal? from collapsing in, in on itself by, you know, customizing dilators or customizing, um, you know, sexual wellness tools as well. So um, that's kind of where we see the vision of the, of the company growing from here. Absolutely. Uh, we have another question from the audience. What is the company status at this point? FDA approval, number, number of employees, next steps? Yeah, so we are currently um, still in development phases. Um, we did execute one clinical study um, and have plans to do another one early, um, towards the end of this year. Um, we are targeting FDA clearance for the end of this year as well. So I'm hoping to get our devices to the market by um, early 2024. Wow, that's very exciting. And then so far, you know, what has been kind of an influential or, or aha moment in your career and or, or just with the company and, and kind of the the journey of that? What exactly do you mean? Like, as in like, when, when, what was the point that we kind of decided like, yeah, maybe just elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, or just a, a great milestone that maybe you've had in the past year um, that 
you know, you're really excited about either yeah, yeah, yeah. As Inara or just femme therapy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I will say, you know, the first in women feasibility study that we concluded in February, that was the first time our devices went inside a patient after four wow. years of development. So that was super exciting to kind of see our devices go from the bench to inside a patient and, you know, seeing a lot of our um, hypothesis, but, you know, proved to be true. So that was a super exciting moment. And then the second piece here is we have some very exciting clinical clinical partnerships planned for this year. Um, I'll actually be traveling to Rochester, Minnesota next week to start off um, a partnership with, with Mayo Clinic Accelerate Platform um, to work on you know, further optimizing our predictive models and to work on a clinical integration plan together um, to get our devices out the door next year. So super excited for those next few milestones. That is so incredible. Um, congratulations. Definitely excited. I'm going to be like making a mental note to check uh, January 2024 to see kind of the what, what you're up to. Um, no, thank you so much. I really appreciate the support. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of our, our last questions, which is my favorite question is, you know, as someone who is working and making an amazing impact in this industry, what are some words of advice or lessons learned that you have just in general for the audience? Maybe something that a mentor has told you that you want to then kind of share onwards um, yeah, anything like that. Yeah, I mean, I would just say, you know, go for it. Like, it took me so long to leave my full time job in consulting and just pursue this, you know, full time. I think actually we're coming up to the one year mark where I made that decision. And I haven't looked back since, but I remember just being at that crossroads thinking, you know, do I want to continue pursuing this, you know, safe job that, yes, has great job security, has great pay, has great benefits. Um, or do I want to, you know, try to see where this goes, try to see if I can actually, you know, make this work and put a product out there to the market. And don't get me wrong, the last year was hard. It was super, super hard, you know, um, scaling this business, bringing on the right people, you know, putting our product through all this R&D. Um, but, you know, it's been so rewarding as well, especially, you know, having our devices tested for the first time in a patient on in February, I can't, you know, forget just how rewarding that feeling was. We had a patient come in to the, to the clinic actually with freshly baked muffins and, and a handwritten card. And she was just so excited to just be able to have this opportunity to get fitted with a custom pessary. So, you know, moments like that is really what keeps us, you know, motivated and keeps us going because this really and truly will make an impact on someone's life, no matter how small. Um, and so that's, that's my word of, you know, advice to anybody out there that's looking to, you know, looking for a career switch, looking to test out or bring an idea to the market, just go for it. You'll never regret it. Uh, wow. I'm speechless. And I, I don't even want to like add to that because that was so incredible. Thank you so much, Inara, for such an inspiring conversation. Um, I think I could speak for all of us when I say that we are so excited to see this company grow and all the amazing things that you're going to do. Um, and we'll definitely have to have a part two of this conversation um, kind of at the next milestone. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thanks, Inara. I also wanted to thank our sponsors for sponsoring this amazing conversation. Uh, please be sure to join us next week for another great conversation. Um, we also wanted to give one last huge shout out to our guest, Inara, um, and to you all. Happy Women's Day, and we will see you next Wednesday. Bye, everyone.